Bridge to Liberty, from Red Kowloon to Free Hong Kong. Eleven weary men trudge the last few yards after two and a half years of captivity and torture in Red China. The flyers are led by Colonel John Arnold, senior officer aboard the B-29 when it was shot down. Major William Balmer is still on crutches as the result of injuries suffered when the plane on a leaflet dropping mission was down. It is a harrowing story with a happy ending, a story in which an aroused world demanded their release through the United Nations. Thirty interminable months of brainwashing come to an end at the Jockey Club, where the creature comforts of civilized men become unbelievable luxuries, where a clean body gives a man self-respect, where the drinking of a soft drink means the end of a nightmare. Their names are known to all Americans who have followed anxiously and angrily the fate of men enduring a living death. They stand as a cause for rejoicing, but in their faces there's a warning of the ruthless enemy we face. The ancient capital of the Incas plays host to President Gustavo Rojas Pinilla of neighboring Colombia, who is greeted by President Jose Ibarra of Ecuador and members of the diplomatic corps. The state visit cements the long-standing friendship between the two South American republics, and Quito is in a holiday mood for the event. Powerful members of the military college form the honor escort as the two heads of state ride to the presidential palace. Members of both Ecuadorian and Colombian military colleges demonstrate their precision marching as they put their best foot forward in a demonstration of welcome. 68 persons have a brush with death as an airliner overshoots midway field and plows through a fence at the end of the field. Despite failure of reversible propellers and brakes, skillful handling brings the big craft to a halt across the street adjoining the airport. The pilot swerves to avoid a concrete abutment and parked automobiles. Miraculously, none is hurt as whirling props drive the fence through the fuselage, inflicting a deep gash. A pilot's calm skill averts a tragedy of major proportions. American and NATO officers are welcomed by Italian officials as they arrive in Turin on a mission which marks a turning point in Italy's Air Force. The occasion is graced by the presence of Claire Booth Luce, U.S. Ambassador to Italy, present to witness the delivery of American-made F-86 jet planes to Italy. The planes shipped from America have been assembled at Italy's famed Fiat plant, which later will manufacture planes of its own design under agreement with NATO. Even as tension in Europe decreases, wings for NATO are stepped up to keep the peace. At Kings Point Merchant Marine Academy, 96 members of the class of 55 take part in graduation ceremonies. One takes no part in the mass swearing in for United States Naval Reserve Commissions. Eugene Landy, the second man in the class with three awards for scholarship, plus honors in football and tennis. Barred from an ensign's commission only hours before the ceremony, because his mother was a Communist Party member in 1944, Landy receives his academy diploma and mate's papers. Meanwhile, the Navy, spurred by a nationwide reaction, has announced a careful restudy of the case. This summer, Landy will ship out as a naval seaman, going on to Yale Law School as a scholarship student, confident of ultimate vindication. From Texas to Korea, the long arm of friendship stretches. 4-H club children of Seoul parade their thanks to club members from Texas for much-needed farm gifts to help rebuild a ravaged land. The delegation that brought the livestock marches in the parade after presenting the cows and pigs and sheep to the Koreans. A Korean hat and pipe will make wonderful souvenirs back in the Lone Star State, while a bit of old Texas, a 10-gallon hat, stays in Korea with President Syngman Rhee. That Stetson looks mighty familiar to old Bossy. Well, howdy, partner.